The supersonic multi-role, multi-service F-35 Lightning II represents a quantum leap in air superiority capability, combining the next-generation fighter characteristics of radar-evading stealth, supersonic speed and fighter agility with the most powerful and comprehensive integrated sensor package of any fighter aircraft in history. The F-35 delivers unprecedented lethality and survivability to the United States Air Combat Forces and its Coalition Joint Air Forces partners. In this modern era of air combat, there are two kinds of jet fighters, stealth fighters and targets. F-35 development started in 1992 and is set to culminate in full production in 2018. It is the first mass-produced aircraft to include structural nanocomposites. The F-35 has been designed to have a low radar cross-section that is primarily due to the shape of the aircraft and the use of stealth radar absorbent materials in its construction including fiber mat. Unlike the previous generation of fighters, the F-35 was designed for very low observable characteristics. Besides radar stealth measures, the F-35 incorporates infrared signature and visual signature reduction measures. The Pratt & Whitney F-135 engine that powers the F-35 is a radar stealth afterburning jet engine that can fly at Mach 1.2 for 150 miles without the use of an afterburner. The F-35 Distributed Aperture System, or DAS, is the first of its kind state-of-the-art sensor systems with six sensors embedded around the plane that provide the pilot a 360 degrees bubble view and can integrate information with weapon systems equipped with the highly touted electro-optical targeting system called EOTS. An active electronically scanned array radar called AISA can identify threats at much greater distances and in tandem with Northrop Grumman's communications navigation and identification avionics suite, called CNI, when combined together, makes the F-35 truly a game-changer. The ability to see and not be seen is redefining previous generation air-to-air -air tactics, and thus remove the need to dogfight by initiating lethal action from a standoff distance. The information gathered by F-35 sensors can be securely shared at high speed with commanders at sea, in the air or on the ground, providing a linked network allowing a comprehensive and dynamic view of ongoing battle operations as it unfolds. The entire battle network data which pours into the plane are made possible by a core processor that can perform more than 400 billion operations per second. This core processor collects data from a classified electronic library of radar signatures and profiles, compiled and cross-indexed to identify enemy radar, electronic warfare emissions and adversary equipment. The data inputs are autonomously integrated parametrically and displayed in the augmented reality visor of the F-35 pilot's helmet-mounted display, cascading a menu of best options for the pilot to make accurate, relevant, rapid decisions optimized to achieve critical mission objectives. It is a human-machine collaboration aided by artificial intelligence. Underpinning the F-35's unrivaled capabilities is more than 8 million lines of software code, more than four times the amount of the world's first fifth-generation fighter, the F-22 Raptor. This information dominance, sensor fusion capability, situational awareness ensures the F-35 entire package delivers and raises the highest level of astounding capabilities in the current fight and well beyond into the future.
As the backbone of US air combat superiority for generations to come, the F-35 provides a common platform across three variants. The F-35A variant is a conventional takeoff and landing aircraft designed for the US Air Force as a complement to the F-22 Raptor and primary air-to-ground multi-role replacement for both the F-16 Falcon and A-10 Thunderbolt II. The F-35A is significantly more lethal and survivable in the full spectrum of air-to-air -air and air-to-surface scenarios than its predecessors. The F-35B is short takeoff, vertical landing aircraft designed to be the single strike fighter for the US Marine Corps, replacing both the AV-8B Harrier and F-18 Hornet. The F-35B will deliver unprecedented flexibility for use at damaged airstrips, austere expeditionary operating sites, major bases and afloat on aircraft carriers and smaller amphibious ships. underlying support structure I think has been uh, eye-opening to a lot of the uh, individual Marines out here uh, and I think they have a better appreciation for how difficult it is to take an airplane from a concept to actuality on a flight deck on an amphibious assault ship at sea. We've been out in high seas, six degree rolls, better than two degrees of pitch, we've been uh, high wind over deck, external stores, heavyweight takeoffs, take a look at men performing takeoffs with the guests to come about on purpose. Some of our other flight operations that we've done with the deck has been really kind of getting stuff for us. We really need to do that. We're looking at kind of situations that we might not see every day, but on the day that it needs to see those situations, we know that it can perform. <laughs>
that serious. It is work at a dedication and selflessly dedicated effort level that is just unparalleled. I've never seen anything like it. I'm so proud to be surrounded by the talent and the dedicated personnel that make this kind of Good morning to everyone on the flight deck. Aircrew now manning for event one, case one launch, case one recovery. Temperature 76 degrees, altimeter 2966, density altitude 1787. Personnel not involved with flight house must now leave the flight deck catwalk. Time to on the complete and proper flight deck uniform. Helmets and blow coats on, gloves on, sleeves rolled down. Check your pockets for loose gear and pod. Check chocks, tie down chains, and loose gear about the decks. Ensure hot exhaust is not blowing on the aircraft. Weapons or personnel. Stand well clear of all rotors, prop arcs, dead intakes, and exhaust. Start to go aircraft. Start them up. The F-35C is carrier variant designed for the U.S. Navy and Marine Corps as a first day of war survivable strike fighter complemented by the F-18 Super Hornet while replacing the F-18 Hornet. The F-35C is capable of overcoming a variety of threats such as surface-to-air missiles, air-to-air missiles and tactical aircraft while enhancing mission success through its unprecedented stealth at sea capability, advanced jamming, threat system detection, command and control supremacy, and unrivaled interoperability with other aircraft. The spectrum of tests that we've done out here is, is pretty wide ranging. You know, the, the sexy stuff that we get, the aircraft flying around, we did a lot of catapults, uh, did a lot of recovery, approach work mission flying, looking at uh, J-PALs, ICLS work at the back of the boat, did some stuff at night, uh, but that, that encompasses only a little bit of what we've done out here. There's a lot of additional work that uh, logistics test and evaluation has done that you can really only do out here at the ship, with the ship's shape, with the ship motion, with the ship's company. Uh, so we've done a lot uh, on the hangar deck with the engine, done a lot with the aircraft, done a lot with the flying program, and it, it's really been multifaceted. The big thing was the minimum end airspeed test. We did that at both mill and max power at 60,000 pounds and 55,000 pounds gross weight. So we went out and we found the no kidding minimum airspeed that you can launch uh, the jet off at those weights in mill and max power. We were testing down to our min plus zero end airspeed point. We try to get to that lowest min point because we add 15 knots for the safety of our pilots and for the aircraft uh, to safely fly away in any condition and the reason we try to get the lowest point possible is because that's the lowest energy necessary to safely launch the aircraft. So it's definitely a little bit different than your normal catapult launch. Uh, the biggest thing you feel is you feel the jet kind of squat underneath you, the nose pitch up. Uh, you're obviously really looking at altitude to see how low it's actually going to sink. Uh, but then the jet flies away and it's a non-event. We did a lot of cleanup, stuff that we didn't, weren't able to finish, so we opened up the crosswind envelope, so now you have a bigger range of winds of which you can launch the airplane. There's not a lot of times that the aircraft carrier will get into 15 knot crosswinds. They, they really manage their winds well. The captain of the ship is very conscious and, and talks to the sailors regularly about this is what our job is, to, to manage the winds, to manage the sea space, to recover aircraft. Uh, but there are times when you're in a, uh, an operational environment where you may be constrained by the sea space that you have, uh, other traffic, and in that case you may have to accept greater crosswinds. This time we got out to 15 knots both on the bow and on the waist catapults uh, and had good, uh, good results for the aircraft launching and flying away in all the crosswinds that we looked at. I did have the opportunity to do the uh, Gen 2 night test last time around and uh, this time I flew the Gen 3 helmet. So the primary differences are the alignment quality of the helmet was a lot better, so that means the pitch ladder and its representation of the real world matched better. Um, it also had better image quality, better night vision camera, and uh, overall better display of the symbology. So a lot of our problems that we saw in the uh, Gen 2 helmet, we didn't really see as much in the uh, Gen 3. So it was, a, it was a great opportunity to see how the technologies improve from the one generation to the next one. And what, what we can give the fleet uh, once we finally figure out the final solution.
J-PAL's is Joint Precision Aircraft Landing System, and it's basically just a tool, an instrument tool that we're gonna use to do precision landings at the ship. It's actually got a really nice feature that none of our other uh, landing aids have. It, it's data linked the final bearing of the ship, and that displays on our tactical situation display at all times when you have it up. So it's kind of nice. It gives you a situation where it's not only where the ship is at, but where it's pointed and uh, where you need to go to line up with centerline for landing. The next version of the software will have a, a, the full precision landing capability. That's what we'll test at DP3. However, the Catbird does have that software in it already. So we actually have the Catbird out here flying approaches to the ship. So you have a 737 aircraft flying approaches coming down um, on final to the carrier uh, and then waving it off obviously prior to touchdown. But they were, they were testing that precision landing capability in the Catbird. We didn't leave anything on the table. We, we accomplished everything we set out to do. We, we performed. Uh, it's a lot like what we've come to expect as our, our standard. The, the teams work well, efficiently, uh, almost autonomously. It's not what the aircraft do that makes you proud anymore. It's how the team works. It's how the team adapts and overcomes. It's neat to watch the aircraft do what they do, you know. It's watching the end speed and the aircraft sink off the bow was always gonna be a memorable thing. But what is more memorable than that is watching the team make it happen, watching the team work together, uh, support each other, to put that pilot in a dangerous situation, but to do it smartly and with the proper mitigation. So if something goes wrong, we know we're not gonna hurt somebody. And, and that to me is the special nature of all of this work is the teaming, the people, uh, and watching them overcome and adapt. The F-35 is armed with a four barrel version of the 25 millimeter cannon in an external pod with 220 rams for the F-35B and F-35C. The gun pod has stealth features. The cannon is mounted internally with 182 rounds for the F-35A. Software updates to enable operational firing of the cannon are expected to be completed by 2018. The F-35 has two internal weapons bays and external hardpoints for up to four underwing pylons and two near wingtip pylons. The external pylons can carry missiles, bombs and external fuel tanks. The two outer hardpoints can carry pylons for the AIM-9X Sidewinder and AIM-132 short-range air-to-air missiles only. The other pylons can carry the AIM-120 medium-range and beyond visual range air-to-air missiles or air-to-ground 158 missiles. Other armaments include joint air-to-surface standoff cruise missile, guided smart bombs and the 700 pounds tactical B61 Mod 12 thermonuclear precision guided gravity bombs. In all, the F-35 can carry a total of 18,000 pounds of munitions. As a single seat fighter, the F-35 relies on advanced training techniques to prepare pilots for first flight. Three training centers across the United States host the latest courseware, electronic classrooms, simulators, flight events, and event-based maintenance training. To support mission rehearsal and tactics development, F-35 training technologies are also located at operational locations. More than 200 US and international suppliers are contributing to the F-35 training system. The F-35 program is built on extensive industrial participation to generate economic growth in F-35 nations and deliver the most affordable, effective technologies. In all of the high-fidelity, full-mission simulators, F-35 software gives students the most realistic experience possible while accelerating the process for software upgrades as the F-35 continues to develop and mature. Flexibility is fundamental to the design of the training system and is built into every element, allowing the system to accommodate all three aircraft variants and all US and international services. 
The F-35 presents new ways to tactically employ and require pilots to master new competencies. Pilots train for a broad range of air-to-air, air-to-ground and electronic warfare missions in the simulator. The fidelity of the full mission simulators currently allows 45 to 55 percent of initial training flights to be accomplished virtually. The syllabus includes technology-driven academics, flights in the full mission simulator and live flights in the aircraft. The F-35 Integrated Training Center at Eglin Air Force Base, Florida is a first-of-its-kind facility. The F-35 training system for pilots and maintainers blends together a variety of training media to create a total training solution for the F-35. The Grim Reapers of Strike Fighter Squadron VFA-101, the Navy's first F-35C carrier variant squadron, also call Eglin home. Eglin Air Force Base also served as the initial training base for the Warlords of Marine Fighter Attack Training Squadron 501 VMFAT-501, comprised of F-35B pilots and maintainers, and continues to house the U.S. Marine Corps' growing fleet of F-35Cs. U.S. Marine Corps F-35B pilot training has now transitioned to Marine Corps Air Station Beaufort, South Carolina, where the VMFAT-501 continues to grow its capacity and will also train UK and Italy F-35B pilots. Additional pilot training for the US Air Force and all international partners who fly the F-35A is hosted by the 61st Fighter Wing at Luke Air Force Base, Arizona. Because of the aircraft's computing power, F-35 maintainers must bring a high level of technical expertise to their jobs. All maintenance training is conducted at Eglin Air Force Base. Maintainers rotate from the classroom to training devices to develop an in-depth understanding of the F-35 weapon system. The mix of simulation and flight line training varies per maintenance students. This enables students to execute tasks like maintenance on the landing gear, loading weapons on the aircraft, and more. After graduating from the schoolhouse training at any of the three locations, Eglin Air Force Base, Luke Air Force Base, or Marine Corps Air Station Beaufort, both pilots and maintainers remain in a continuous learning environment with access to all training courseware, applications, and deployable training devices to keep their training up to date and sharp. International training will expand significantly in the coming years, as training facilities in the UK, Italy, Australia, Israel, Norway, South Korea and Japan begin to stand up in 2017 and 2018. On the other side of the equation, it takes more than steel, advanced electronics and engine thrust to make the F-35 Lightning II, the world's fifth generation fighter, take flight. It is the Autonomic Logistics Information System, affectionately called ALICE, that gives F-35 Lightning II operators the ability to plan ahead, to maintain and sustain its systems over the life of the air vehicle. ALICE provides the IT backbone and capabilities to support current and future warfighters across the US and coalition military services. ALICE integrates a broad range of capabilities, including operations, maintenance, prognostics, supply chain, customer support services, training and technical data. A single secure information environment provides users with up-to-date information on any of these areas using web-enabled applications on a distributed network. ALICE serves as the information infrastructure for the F-35, transmitting aircraft health and maintenance action information to the appropriate users on a globally distributed network to technicians worldwide. The F-35 is the first tactical aviation system to have sustainment tools engineered in concert with the aircraft for efficiency and cost-effectiveness. Compared to previous aircraft, a higher fidelity of information about the F-35 fleet is tracked within ALICE to reduce operations and maintenance costs and increase aircraft availability. ALICE turns data from many sources into actionable information, 
enabling pilots, maintainers and military leaders to make proactive decisions to keep jets flying. The crew is very excited to have finally arrived in Sasebo, Japan. After a long transit to get here and after several years of planning to make this a reality. Now that we are in Sasebo, we will begin by conducting some maintenance and training and assessment period in preparation for the ship's first patrol in the region. The F-35 Joint Strike Fighter Program was built under the premise of lethality, survivability, commonality and affordability. It is the largest single defence program in global history, projected over its 2070 service lifespan to cost $406.5 billion for the acquisition of 2,443 aircraft scheduled for delivery till 2037 and $1.5 trillion for operations and maintenance. The United States principally funds the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter development, with additional funding from partners. Therefore, the joint and multinational acquisition aspect of the F-35 fifth-generation fighter is of primary global interest. Over the last several years, WASP has been modified specifically to employ the F-35B Joint Strike Fighter. Those modifications make her one of the most amph advanced amphibious ships in the fleet, and we look forward to par partnering with the F-35B in the Indo-Asia Pacific region for security and stability. In January 2017, the U.S. Marine Corps deployed its first F-35B squadron to Japan. The U.S. Marine Corps Fighter Attack Squadron 121 is currently made up of 16 F-35B aircraft. The squadron, which five years ago became the first in the Marine Corps to receive the high-tech, single-engine, single-seat, multi-role jets, also became the first forward-deployed F-35 squadron when it moved to Iwakuni from Marine Corps Station Yuma. Since relocating from Yuma, Arizona to Iwakuni, Japan in January 2017, the Marine Corps' first squadron of F-35B Joint Strike Fighters has been hard at work ironing out the basics of operations in the Pacific, from streamlining supply chains to practicing hot reloads and rapid ground refueling. The unit's reception in the Iwakuni community has been warm. Iwakuni Mayor Yoshihiko Fukuda attended the March Change of Command ceremony for the unit, and an aviation day at the air station drew a crowd of 210,000, with locals surrounding a displayed F 35B. The US Navy is also deploying one of its largest surface warships, the WASP class amphibious assault ship USS WASP, to Japan in the fall of 2017. The ship will be able to operate the F-35B from its flight deck. Marine Fighter Attack Squadron 121 will deploy abroad the amphibious assault ship WASP with the 31st Marine Expeditionary Unit. The squadron is well aware that a sea deployment in the tense Pacific could well entail responding to a regional crisis or a combat contingency, according to the squadron's commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Richard Rusnock. Colonel Rusnock noted that, in the space of months, the Joint Strike Fighter program went from being based almost solely in the continental United States to having aircraft in Israel, Italy and Japan, among other locations. The F-35 is designed with the entire battle space in mind, bringing new flexibility and capability to the United States and its allies. Reliance on any single capability, electronic attack, stealth, speed, is not sufficient for success and survivability in the future. Missions, traditionally performed by specialized aircraft, air-to-air -air combat, 
air-to-ground strikes, electronic attack, intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance can now be executed by a squadron of F-35s. Red Flag is a realistic combat training exercise involving the air, space and cyber forces of the United States and its allies. The exercise is hosted north of Las Vegas on the Nevada Test and Training Range, the US Air Force's premier military training area with more than 15,000 square miles of airspace and 2.9 million acres of land. The Red Flag exercise is one of a series of advanced training programs administered at Nellis Air Force Base. The exchange rates, I read the blogosphere, 15 to 1, the last uh, uh, red flag. I get seen the blogosphere, the retired Marine generals writing, that can't be true. I'm like, it is true. I, I'm, not, I'm not challenging that whatsoever. I see that in the last three WTI classes we ran at Mach 1. The scenarios we could never get in before, that our airplanes got shot down, and more importantly, because we're always going to try to get in there and deliver that bomb for the Marine on the ground, we, in simulated exercise, we lost a lot of airplanes in scenarios that uh, were fourth generation airplanes and putting in both our Prowlers, our Hornets, and our Harriers. That changed when we brought in fifth generation airplanes, specifically F-35. We're achieving astounding uh, uh, results in the highest threat scenarios and that across the range of military operations fight with the F-35. It's, it is changing things in a, in a very decisive way. We just had a... Uh, 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 a, uh, a what we call a Marine Division Tactics uh, class down in Beaufort, South Carolina. And uh, we had a scenario out there that was a 20 v. 8, uh, 20 versus 8, 20 bad guys against 8 good guys. In those 8 good guys were four Marine F-35Bs. Um, what, that was interesting. Basically, the, the 20 guys had a very bad day. I'll leave it at that. The 8 had a very good day. They all came home. Um, but it was most important in the debrief, um, one of the, the pilots talking about the, all the kills they made, and the majority of the kills came from the F-35s. Um, he was very clear, he was, he was amazing presence. He talked about uh, what he did, and uh, when it, they found out who he was, he was a, he was a, a Cat 1 student in our, in, our, in our fleet replacement squadron. This was his graduation exercise. We have brand new guys coming out of the training pipeline flying this airplane that are operating like Marine veterans that have three or four years experience. I've never seen anything like it. I thought I'd want to tell you about that today. I'll tell you that uh, this airplane's giving our pilots a decisive advantage. You talk about the 20 to zero, the 20, the 20 to one, the 24 to zero that we've been enjoying out there at the weapons school. That's the zero means we're not losing these aviators. And it's not just a fighter threat. It's a very high-end SAM threat, which in days gone by would have been, we call it prohibitive interference. And, I ran a drill when I was a weapons uh, CO, school CO in Yuma. We lost half the fleet, and we didn't hit any targets. So in a simulation, that's, everybody comes back with a long face, talks about how bad the day was. In the real world, they're, they're not coming back. So this is a very survivable airplane. I mean, incredible. I, the analogy they talk about, and just what uh, General Bogdan talked about, in days gone by, when in my youth, we, we did, it was almost like a football game. Every player had their role, running backs, quarterbacks, linebackers. Uh, tailbacks. This airplane is more like, it's like a soccer match. Everybody is, it's, has the opportunity to be the killer. Everybody sees, everybody shares, and frankly, every exercise, whether it's Air Force, the Marine Corps, whoever's flying this airplane embedded in a large package, it makes everybody else more survival. The next WTI, we're going to guide for a, uh, a Marine artillery unit, uh, the Glimmers, give them GPS uh, we shot uh, basically working with the Navy with the Aegis cruiser in the desert simulation out there, but a real missile uh, at a low flying uh, target out there, shot an, an Aegis missile with a mantle, and it was beyond a mountain range and direct hit. Uh, we tracked a, a missile going up out of Vandenberg from 300 miles away. It's changing survivability for everybody in a very positive way. We got something new on our hands, and I think it's very positive. 17-3 in particular is a U.S. only uh, red flag. And so we get to take uh, that opportunity to the next level, if you will. Uh, this red flag alone is uh, our singular largest uh, fifth gen footprint that we've had, uh, largest F-35 footprint we've had at red flag. As this aircraft continues to grow and the operators, the maintainers around that aircraft and the system writ large, we get to learn as we continue to build. And so having two F-35 units here at the same time 
one being Air Force, one being the Marine Corps. Not only do we get to learn about the F-35 even more, but we get to learn about what our sister services are doing with the airplane as well as what the Air Force is doing. As we look to try to be innovative and getting after these tough problem sets, that is only going to increase our readiness because we're getting smarter as a force, we're getting smarter as a joint warfighter uh, and going after these tough threats. And that's what Red Flag offers. Our ultimate goal, this being our third and final developmental trip to sea, is to complete the launch bulletins and the recovery bulletins that the fleet will need to utilize this airplane when it's out in the fleet for use. Specifically, we're looking to expand the envelope, adding external stores and specifically lateral asymmetries to continue expanding both the arresting envelope as well as the catapult launch envelope of the F-35C. As test pilots, it's our responsibility to go and, and do and see different wind envelopes and wind cells with these same stores loadouts before the fleet ever sees it. That way, if there are any issues, we as test pilots and as testers of the X-23, we want to see these first before the, uh, before the fleet uh, ever sees it. I think it's going really well. I think we're ahead of schedule, uh, kind of knocking things out of the park. I think things went, from my perspective, went a lot better than I would have thought. It's the ship, this company has been pretty phenomenal in working with us, allowing us to adjust as we need to to make sure we get, whether it's the wind over the deck or adjusting our schedule so we can make sure we get everything. So it's been pretty awesome working with the crew here on the GW. Ship trials are always fun. There are always things that are completely unexpected that uh, the ship throws in your way, and there are things that we do that we throw in the ship's way. And in the end, it's, it's that relationship that makes it work. great experience to fly the jet and so to come out here and actually get to fly it in the environment that we've been practicing in and testing it to was just a really great and exciting experience and out here with the external loads and asymmetric loads on the airplane it is almost imperceptible to tell the difference of the flying qualities of the aircraft between the two different configurations the jet compensates for it very well and it really makes the task to the pilot is seamless. We accomplished 121 catapult launches, 121 arrested landings, zero one wires, and we came out here and we got to witness VFA 101 do the first operational daytime carrier qualification where they came out and did about 120 arrested landings with zero one wires. So I really think the promise of the airplane, the handling qualities of the airplane, and the advanced flying modes really showed everybody what it's capable of doing. So F-35C, our first fifth gen fighter launching off our carrier decks, that gives us an ability that we haven't had up to this point. It should give us the ability to go first day of the war strike fighter again to execute the strike missions for the carrier strike group. And that's something quite frankly that, that we haven't had in a long time.
Yeah, F-35, you know, uh, the Lightning has uh, performed fantastic. But very few people actually uh, thought we would make it out here this November uh, with two planes to do any substantial amount of testing. This is a monumental uh, task that we've performed. It's been a great team uh, to work with, and uh, it's just, this, uh, this is probably the culmination of uh, my Navy career. Bringing the F-35C really to the Navy and to naval aviation. Uh, this is a huge milestone for the F-35 program, and it's a huge milestone for the Navy. In the last two weeks, we've been able to uh, accomplish all of our uh, catapult testing that we want to do. Uh, do. We've uh, executed the minimum catapult end speed as well as started building out in uh, crosswind capability. We've really affirmed how good a flyer it is. We've done it in uh, low wind environments, high wind env environments, crosswinds, strong burbles, uh, and actually we had a little bit of pitching deck on here and uh, all of that the F-35 has come through with glowing remarks. Next we came out here and we uh, proved the concept of Delta Flight Path. That's been a fantastic story. And it is something that uh, makes our life a lot easier because it controls our glide slope very precisely as we approach the ship. I'm coming around to make a planned trap. We had higher weather requirements when we were here and as we got into it, the weather started coming down and we had such confidence in how the airplane was flying. We decided to lower the mince knowing that when I put my hook down and I roll into the groove, I'm going to trap. Uh, and that, that says a lot for the airplane. When it came down to night ops, we said the airplane's ready for its first time behind the boat. Um, Two hook down passes, two traps, uh, and that says that says it all right there. The airplane is performing very well, uh, not only from the pilot's perspective behind the ship, but the maintainers are getting their hands on the airplane. They're finding that the airplane is very manageable on the carrier. Underway these, these past two weeks, these aircraft have held up absolutely remarkable. It's floored me on how well these aircraft have come aboard, landed, launched, recovered, and with minimal gripes and with the gripes that we've, we've had, we've actually repaired them very quickly. Well, we have pretty much accomplished everything we'd set out to do. So what that positioned us for is that uh, the next time we're gonna go out allows us to go right into the DT2 event. Uh, once we go back out to the boat, we will do external stores, internal stores, max catapult shots, and asymmetry. So both launches and then approach and handling qualities. What we're doing uh, on the USS Nimitz with the F-35 really is defining the future of naval aviation. We're finally bringing fifth generation aircraft to the Navy. Uh, so we can launch fifth gen fighters from the sea now. The first part of being able to launch fifth gen technology from the sea is to make sure that we can safely land and safely launch from the ship. And that's what we're primarily doing this at sea period.
specifically the F-35B Lightning. Now, get those cameras ready. As the aircraft returns to ground center, the pilot will complete a slow pass that shows the profile of the aircraft to give you the best camera angle possible. 